Jennifer Rose. Um, I'm an academic here at the University of Manchester. Um, I've been teaching on the MBA now for a few years, the global MBA and the full-time MBA as well. Um, I qualified as an accountant back in 2008, worked at KPMG and then moved into teaching on the professional qualification and now into lecturing at the University of Manchester. Um, I'm a senior lecturer now um, and I got the Teacher of the Year uh, award in 2020, which was a very difficult year to be doing teaching, believe me. Um, and I'm also a huge lover of questions and interactions. So that's why straight away I'm asking you what you think about Can Accountants Save the World? And I would love to get your questions and answers as we go through. So ask those questions for anything that's burning, the burning questions for you. So in terms of can uh, accountants say the world, I think it's a really big question and it is deliberately meant to be a provocative question. Uh, Peter Backer, who is CEO of the World um, Business, let me get this right, for the World Business um, I can't remember what I've written, for Sustainable Development, and he said this in 2012 at the Rio UN, UN conference, that he thinks accountants can save the world, and in fact he argues that accountants are one of, one of the people in the only place of power to be able to actually save the world, and I'm going to show you some of my thoughts around this as we go through the next 40 minutes or so that we've got together. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to get your thought, your opinions on how much accounting you've done. So when I teach on the MBA, there are some people that are brand new to accounting. Uh, there are some people that have done quite a lot of accounting or even have an accounting qualification. So let me know where you are on this scale. Oh, excellent. I've got an expert. And that's fantastic. And when, I, when we teach on the MBA, we always try and play to people's strengths. So we have we try and pair up people that have done accounting before to those that haven't. And when I teach on the full time MBA, teach my accounting, we all work in teams and run simulated businesses. And on each of those teams, you make sure there's an accountant so that everyone can learn from each other. And then on other parts of the MBA, when it's marketing, those who have done marketing before get the chance to shine. So we've got a nice mix across here. Fantastic. It's good to see. Okay. So today I'm going to try and challenge you to think differently um, about the world of accounting and financial reporting and accountability. They're all kind of badged together for this session. So I'm going to tell you about the stories that are told through accounts and um, the kind of basis for financial reporting, that all important diff difference between profit and cash. And then just think a little bit about the role of accounting and the future of accounting. So it's very much based on accounting. Um, and I know there's some accountants in the room and some that have never seen accountants before. So I really want to get your answer to this question then. So what do you think about accounting? So just one or two words about what you think about accounting at this point. Even that person who wrote, what, what is this thing accounting? What, when, when I say accountant, what comes to mind? Numbers, yes. And numbers are a really important part of accounting. And um, being comfortable with numbers is important. But actually, accounting is an art and not a science. So it's using numbers as evidence to tell a story, which is what the company is trying to do. Complicated, yeah, it, it can be complicated. I do agree with that. And there are some very uh, difficult technical bits. However, um, I think that accountants, uh, trained accountants tend to create a bit of a role for themselves by making it sound more complicated than it actually is. Balance sheets, liabilities, storytelling. Yeah, exactly as I said. I think accounting is much more about storytelling, explaining what's happening in a company and painting that picture in a certain way. In fact, one of the assessments I've just marked for my MBA students um, was asking them to tell the story of that simulated company that they, uh, they worked on. And, and that's a really important part of accounting is using numbers to tell the story. Accounting is an art, not a science. Let's see what else we've got. Number crunching, decision making. Yeah, definitely. So accounting um, is used to make decisions and also to justify decisions. Accountability and accuracy, good. Ledger, balance, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, making accounts balance. So there's a, a balancing equation that our assets minus our liabilities is equal to the ownership interest. And that's what our balance sheet is made up of, which you'll see that in a few, um, a few minutes. 
future opportunities. Yeah, I think there are quite a lot of opportunities. At the moment, there's not enough qualified accountants to do some of the role that the government's asking them to do around auditing, especially auditing sustainability. Whilst they've got the skills to do it, they're not actually enough accountants at the moment to be able to fulfill that role. And that's why accountants have just had such a big pay increase over the last year or so, and to try and keep people in accounting. So it's a bit of an interesting time at the moment to be a, a, an accountant and definitely lots of future future opportunities. Economic activities. I don't know what that means. That's a good one. If you can put in the chat box what you mean by that, I'd be really interested to know. OK, let's move on. So I want to talk to you about accountability, which is what some of you have talked about on the last uh, word cloud. I want to talk to you about profit not being the same as cash. That's more for the non-accountants um, to make sure that you're understanding the basis of this. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about accounting can save the world and some of the ways that accounting does and could save the world. Not exactly the same as them actually saving the world. So these are uh, the financial statements of a company. They are the only piece of um, checked reporting checked evidence that's sent out to the shareholders that own the businesses they are a story the um accountants and the directors of the company use the numbers to tell the story about what's happened for a company over the last year these are a marketing tool for the directors to encourage investors to invest in the company so if you're ever looking at financial statements, and I would encourage you to look, look at financial statements whenever you can to develop your uh, li accounting literacy, um, bear in mind that they are biased documents. They are written, the words are written in order to sell the company. The financial statements, the core statements that we'll talk about in a little bit are audited. So that means they're checked by the auditors and confirmed that they're not, that they are materially correct, that they've not got big errors in them. But the story, the written, all the written reports are written as a marketing document to try and convince investors to invest. So they definitely put a really shiny light on it. And you need to bear that in mind if you're ever thinking about trying to understand what happens in financial statements. But they are the only verified source of information between um, the directors running the company and the shareholders owning the company. So they're vital uh, report vital bits of information that tell us a lot about a company some of which they want us to know and some of which they don't if you know where you're looking i'd like to know your answer to this question so they are it's, it's a corporate document um, governments do produce them but don't tend to publish them in the same way all listed companies have to produce them well all companies have to produce them all listed companies have to do those long glossy reports so I'd like to know your opinion on, of the top 100 revenue generators in the world, how many are corporations? This is actually pre-pandemic, so I think it may have, it would be interesting to see how that has changed this data. But of the top 100, how many do you think are, are corporations? I've got eight responses so far. I'm going to reveal the answer at the end. Keep going, keep um, interacting with me and let me know your thoughts. And whilst you're doing that, I'm gonna have a quick look at the Q&A, see if I've got any questions so far. Okay, not yet. So get those questions coming. Anything that pops up in your mind, anything that will make the next half an hour that we've got together useful for you, pop that in the Q&A. It doesn't have to be just questions, it can just be your thoughts as well. Keep going, I've got 20 responses and 50 participants. So if you're going to log on to www.responseware.eu and the session ID is MBA 2022 and you don't have to put your details in, just click next or onto the next, next page so it can be anonymous. Have a look, what do you think? Oh, I've got a nice friend. Oh, if we were in class, if we were in class, I would have such a good conversation with you about this. Sadly, I can't. I've been told I'm not allowed to put you in breakout rooms and get you to talk to each other. Um, so a hundred, a hundred percent, fourteen percent of you said that. Uh, nine percent said ninety-one. You're in the right ballpark. The nine percent that said seventy-one percent were correct. So seventy-one of the top one hundred revenue generators are corporations. 
So many companies now are bigger than countries. And we, so we need to rely on companies to be able to tackle the big questions around social justice and around climate change and around saving the world. We can't rely on governments because they simply don't have the control over the assets. They're not generating as much revenue compared to some of these huge companies, your Apples, your Amazons, um, your Starbucks, these huge companies that go across borders. The main verified way they communicate outside of their boardrooms is through financial statements. And that is their main storytelling. And it's the accountants that are putting those numbers together and telling that story. And that's why it's important to know what goes on underneath the financial statements. So the financial statements are the bit at the top, that's what you actually see. And what I talk um, to students about over the course of the, the six, 10 weeks that I teach them is all about what happens underneath. So we, we really unpick financial statements. You see what's on the surface and then what, what are they really saying? Uh, so what are they uh, maybe not telling us so clearly on the front couple of pages? What do we have to dig away at? And we've got to really understand what the basis is for this financial statements. What are they trying to do? So the financial statements were designed and are a are, oops have oh no have a fundamental characteristics that they they need to be relevant and faithfully represent what's happening in the company. So the whole point of financial statements. Whilst it's there to market the company and to sell the shares and encourage investments, it's the basis of it is that it needs to be relevant, relevant to those people that are using them. And it needs to truly and faithfully represent what's happening in the company. And these are the core characteristics that financial reporting are based on. This is set by the, the uh, reporting standards. And all of the reporting standards, all that complicated accounting, where how are you going to account for something, the debits and the credits and what it looks like, all needs to come back to this fundamental characteristic that we're trying to produce information that's relevant to users and that represents what's really going on in the company. Now, it's all under that banner of materiality. So materiality uh, means uh, items that will mislead the users. So a big error. Now, for example, Tesco had the fraud where they um, accounted for too much income. And in that fraud, it was only 250 million, which was not material for Tesco investors because it's such a huge company. So these accounts are not intended to be perfect. They're not intended to be exactly 100 percent correct but they're, they're trying to be relevant to their users. They're trying to tell you what's really going on in the company um, and not have any big errors in them. And that's what the auditors will do. Well, they'll give this opinion, the accounts are true and fair and not materially misstated. So they're not saying they're completely accurate. They're saying they're generally around uh, correct, that they've not got any big errors in them. So all the accounting comes back to these fundamental characteristics. So when you're reading financial statements, bear in mind they are a marketing document. Bear in mind that they are put there to sell the company to the shareholders, but also that they're trying to be relevant and represent what's going on in the company. There are also some enhancing characteristics that financial statements have that they need to be, uh, you need to be able to compare year on year. You need to be able to make uh, predictions about the future. You need to verify them, which is what the auditors would do. They need to be timely, but actually the deadline for the getting them produced is nine months after the year end. And as an investor, I don't think that's particularly timely, but I suppose given the fact that we're trying to make them understandable that ordinary people should be able to read them. And they, they're such a huge document to put together, sometimes 200, 300 pages. It's that, that um, the problem with de delivering item, uh, material that's both timely, but also accurate and verifiable and understandable. So there's a lot of tensions between these enhancing quality of characteristics. I've just seen a couple of questions, so I'm gonna have a quick look. How much background knowledge or experience should one have with accounting before joining the MBA? You don't need any. So some people that I've taught this year, um, this was the starting lecture. This was the point that we started at, assuming you had no knowledge 
of accounting. And I think the MBA is quite unique in that you learn accounting very quickly and then you go on to use it in your various projects. So yes, you, by the end of the MBA, you need to be comfortable with accounting. But before you come on, I don't expect you to have any, any knowledge before. You will have to work a bit harder if it's all new to you. But um, for um, when you start on the MBA, uh, you don't need, you're not expected to have any knowledge. How can accounting be linked to the ESG dynamic of a company? Oh, I like that. I'm going to come back to that one. That's a brilliant question. Okay. So I'm just going to take it back a little bit into um, this. So we've talked about those characteristics that the accounts need to have. They need to represent what's really going on and they need to be relevant to the users. Now I'm just going to take it back to talk about the difference between profit and cash. Some of those fundamentals and um, that the accountants in the room will understand already. But those that are new to accounting might help you just give you a bit of an insight into how these accounts are formed. So it's really important to know that profit is not the same as cash. Um, quite often when you're starting to learn accounting, this is, um, although it sounds obvious, it's actually a really important concept to help you understand how transactions are accounted for. So profit is affected by making a sale, so transferring risks and rewards, or an expense relating to the sale or to the accounting period. So the profit in the profit and the loss is effect, is an accounting creation. It's a number created by accountants uh, that they think give the performance of the company over the period, which is usually a year. And it can be very different from the cash. So the cash is affected by something being paid or money going into or out of a bank account. But profit is an accounting construction. It's where we look at all the sales that have been made, and a sale is made when the risks and rewards are transferred to a customer. And the allocated expenses. So we match the expenses that relate to that sale to that accounting period. So it's a, an accounting creation. It doesn't necessarily reflect the cash going in and out of a company. Of course, a company needs both profit and cash to be successful in the long term. Um, a company that has lots and lots of profit but runs out of cash won't be able to pay its suppliers and will quickly go into liquidation. Similarly, a company with lots and lots of cash but not enough profit Something's will gone wrong with go back out, please. Sorry. Um, a company that's got a lot of uh, profit but no cash won't be able to pay their creditors. And a company that's got a lot of cash but no profit um, won't be able to pay dividends out to its shareholders. So profit is how companies can pay out to their shareholders. Okay, so let's have a try of these questions then. Uh, so if you're new to accounting, give yourself a try. So and one of the model companies that, the case study companies that I use is IAG. It's a really fascinating company, International Airlines Group. And over the year in their accounts at the beginning of the story, they talked about passenger traffic being down 75% and capacity was reduced by 66%. So they weren't able to fly. Um, for a lot, a lot of the time during the pandemic for the last financial statement. So what effect would that have on the accounts? Is it going to affect the cash coming in and out? Is it going to affect their profit? It's going to affect both or not? And when I'm teaching on the, um, the MBA, the accounting course, I'll go through this quite slowly with lots of examples to really help you get clear about what's a cash effect and what's a profit effect, what's both and what is neither. So I've got five, oh, give us a few, I've got 16 responses, keep going. Give it a try, have a guess, get it wrong and learn something. Yeah. Ah. There we go. Yes. So you're right. It has a cash and a profit effect. And IAG are really interesting because they're an airline. So they get a lot of their cash up front from their customers. Um, so they've got quite a lot of deferred income, which means that they've got cash that they've received, but they can't allocate that to their revenue until the flights actually take place. 
Um, so if they've got less traffic, they've got less uh, customers paying in their cash in advance, uh, they would have a cash effect and it would have a profit effect as well, as they're still having to pay out expenses, even though they can't recognize that cash as revenue. So if you said cash and profit effect, then that's correct. What about this question? Let's open my pod here. So this relates to the question and answer we got in here. How can accounting be linked to the ESG dynamic of a company? Um, so if, they, if they've committed to net zero, a lot of companies now are committing to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. What will that affect? You think? Cash effect, profit effect, cash and profit or neither. And um, IAG was one of the first company, well, some of the first airlines to do this and sees itself as leading the way for this net carbon emissions by 2050, which feels like a very long time away for me. But um, I think it's interesting to see how this might affect the accounts. How do you think this will affect the accounts? Oh, neither cash nor profit effect. Now, I would argue that there is very unlikely that this will have a neither cash nor profit effect in the long term. When they make that, st that statement exactly right, as soon as they say that it doesn't affect cash or profit, they can say whatever they want. But over the years between now and 2050, I think it is going to affect their profit. They are going to have to change the way they do things. They're going to have to incur expenses which will reduce their profit. And they're probably gonna at some point have to pay out cash. So this is not a clear cut answer. It's not a yes or no, um, but it's something that I'd definitely debate if we were in class together and discuss and to see the effect that these commitments have on the, on the account. So yes, in the year they make the commitment, there'd be neither cash nor profit effect, but in the future over the next um, 25, 30 years, there will be a, a cash effect, definitely for a company like IAG. And that's how a commitments made like this will pan out and come into the financial statements, whether or not things change, because it is gonna affect the profit and the cash of a company. Okay, last question for now. So this is just a little, little tester about cash effects versus profit effects. So they had to raise, if they have to raise new finance in a loan and a share issue, that's what they did in the year, they were really struggling for cash. What does this affect? Cash, profit, both or neither? So in the year they raised new finance, they got a loan and they had a share issue. So loan is them asking the bank for some money. A share issue is they ask their shareholders for some money. Does this have a cash effect, a profit effect, both or neither? Have a try, even if you're new to accounting and you're not sure, have a try answering. Go on, just a few more. Thank you. Yes. Well done. Um, this would only affect the cash. Mostly. Um, so the loan and the share issue, when the cash comes in for that, they do not recognize any of that as profit. They recognize that as cash in the balance sheet. It would have an effect in terms of the, the fees around the share issue. And going forward, they would have an effect on the profit for the interest raised um, by the, that they have to pay on the loan. But at the point that they raise that loan and the share issue, that would mainly be a cash effect. So IAG actually ended the year with quite a lot of cash, but had a huge loss. So they got lots of cash in, they were able to continue, but they, they, they made an, an enormous loss. And a lot of that was not due to just due to those those. Um, passenger uh, numbers being down and the inability to fly they also did something called an accounting hedge and that is where uh, they bet they made a bet that the the price of fuel would increase because in general the price of fuel always increases but actually uh, the price of fuel decreased because of the pandemic and they lost billions of euros on that so they ended up with a big loss, not just because of loss of passenger numbers, but also this accounting creation called a hedge. And um, they made a bet that the prices of fuel would go up, but actually they went down and they lost a lot of money on that hedge. That was a huge part of their loss. 
So it's thinking about what's a cash effect and what's a profit effect and taking it right back to those basics as we would on the MBA. So you don't need that knowledge to be able to um, start the MBA, certainly. And again, thinking back to those basics. So we've got the four primary statements. We have an income statement, a cash flow, a balance sheet, also known as a statement of financial position and the statement of changes in equity. And these show slightly different things uh, about a company. So your income statement is thinking about those risks and rewards that, you, that the company has transferred when it's earned and expenses for usually a year. So it's over the year, shows you the profit. Very focused. The bottom number is what could be distributed to shareholders. The net profit is what could go out to shareholders. The second statement is the cash flow statement. So cash is really important and having cash coming into a company and investing that cash wisely can all be seen in the cash flow statement. So again, that's over the period, over the year, is the cash coming in and the cash coming out. And um, you've got the balance sheet. The balance sheet is a snapshot. So it's different to the income statement and the cash flow and the statement of change in equity in that it's a snapshot at the year end. And that'll show you all the assets, which is everything the company owns, all the liabilities that they owe to other people and what's left over for the shareholders, the shareholders equity. It was a snapshot at the year end. That's where the counts balancing comes from. That the assets minus the liabilities equals the shareholders' um, ownership interest, the shareholders' funds. It's a snapshot. So it's quite different to an income statement, which is over a period, and a cash flow statement over a period. And finally, the statement of changes in equity explains any uh, gains and losses, any um, profits and losses that don't go through the profit and loss account. So if they don't meet the strict criteria to be part of the income statement, they'd go through that statement of changes in equity. So let's have a quick look at one, look at a couple of layouts anyway. So the income statement looks like this. This is a simplified version of what you might see in accounts, um, but you can see you've got revenue, and we've got the allocated costs to give you a gross margin. Other expenses going through finance expenses, tax expenses to get down to the net profit here. This is what can be distributed to shareholders. And we've got a cash flow statement. So we've got operating profits, any adjustments. Um, we've got cash outflows or inflows from operations. If you're looking at a cash flow statement, it's really important for this number to be positive because that shows that in the day-to-day -day operations of a company, they've got cash coming in. And the, when we did our simulated companies, there were some companies that had a negative number here and they didn't survive very long as we were going through our simulation. Okay, the next um, category is your cash flow from investing activities. Now, normally you might think that it might be best for cash always to be flowing into a company, but actually it's sometimes, it's, well, it is good for this number to be negative, for cash to be going out, investing in the company, um, investing in fixed assets, so assets that we're going to use for a long time, investing in research and development and investing in buying other companies. So anything that's investing activities, this number here being negative is a good thing. That means we're using our cash and cash flows from financing activities, that's where the money you see coming in from the loan and from the share issue that, that IAG did, you see that coming in here. So you can see how the, if we just used a cash basis for accounting, we wouldn't be able to uh, get the nuances of what's happening underlying in the business, where the sales are, where the risks and rewards have been transferred and how the expenses are matched to those sales. Cash the flow statements gives us a lot of information uh, but you need to look at it in tandem with the income statement. And then moving on, so I don't want to go over time. Uh, the balance sheet's that snapshot, and the statement of changes in equity is any of those other adjustments. I do want to talk to you about how accounting can save the world and what accounting's done to save the world um, so far and what they could do, not necessarily what they do do. So. Uh, I'm going to ask you this question then. Do you think accounting has a role in climate change and social justice? And whilst you're asking that, I will have a look at the Q&As.
So we've got some good accountants here in the room. Fantastic. So I've seen it will affect a profit as you have additional costs of borrowing money. Yep. So it will affect a profit, but that initial pay, where's that, where's that money comes in, will mainly affect your cash. It depends on who covers the cost of that transaction company or clients through higher ticket prices. Brilliant. Brilliant. And if we were in class, I would definitely be putting you together and having that debate with you. Fantastic. Um, the other three questions I will talk about as we go through now. Let's see what you think about this. Right, so 70% definitely, 25% probably, 5% don't know, and nobody saying no. So you all think accounting has some kind of role in climate change and social justice. I absolutely agree with you. And um, I draw, I'm drawing on some of the latest research by Paolo, who, is, who also teaches on the MBA and is a big uh, thinker and a publisher in this area. And uh, Brendan O'Dwyer, and he also works with Jeffrey Uhrman, who's sadly no longer with us, but Jan Bebbington as well, um, talking about some of the latest research in how uh, the role of accounting can change and how accountants can um, have a real role in saving the planet. So this is, a, this is a summary of something Paolo's recently published uh, just last year. You can see the income statement that I've already shown you on the left. You can see the revenues that come from that risks and rewards being transferred and the allocated expenses. And it all comes down to this net profit, which is what is uh, distributed to the shareholders. On the other, this is what, on the other side, you can see what Paolo recommends um, as an alternative value added income statement. And to me, this makes so much sense. So it has the revenues and all the ways that the company generates value and then how it's distributed. Oops. So you know how you can see here that employees would normally be one of the costs in operating expenses. Actually, that's a way that wealth is distributed to people. It comes back to the whole reason that we are forming these companies. These companies were formed um, to be able to... Um, have um, reduced costs and better economies of scale and to be able to generate wealth and that wealth is then shared out. But the way the income statement is at the moment solely focuses on shareholders being the beneficiaries of a company. Whereas actually the, the beneficiaries of a company are the employees, the bank that have provided that interest, the state in taxes, the firm, money that goes back into that firm, reinvested into the firm, and the shareholders. So I think accountants would have a much more visible role if this was the new adoption for a value added income statement. And this is the kind of latest thinking that's coming out of AMBS. And actually Paolo takes it one step further. And he talks about the wealth being uh, created and then distributed, but also having an additional stakeholder that's really obvious here called nature. And it's how that wealth created then can be distributed to help restore nature or show that role in climate change. Because um, nature is a really important capital and it is starting to be recognized as such. And you can see from the, the link here, which I can put in the chat box if you'd like it, but it's a, it's a, previously we just talked about financial capital and capital being the money you put into a business, but actually nature has been recognized as another important capital that we need to um, sustain and that companies have a good role in protecting. There's also the, this task force on climate related financial disclosures. So as I explained at the beginning, the financial statements have a lot of storytelling explaining what's happening in the company. And actually, there's an increasing number of climate related financial disclosures. So that companies have to disclose um, climate related items now. And those financial risks to the global so, so climate change is a massive financial risk to the global economy. And that's been recognized as we start to see more and more climate disclosures, not just financial disclosures in the financial statements, in that key document that goes between directors and the shareholders in the wider world. And we've just ha heard um, just end of last year about the formation of the International Sustainability Standards Board. So this is from the IFRS, the International Financial Reporting Standards. I've just set up a new board to try and get standardized sustainability standards across companies. And if you remember back, the IFRS set those key characteristics that financial reporting needs to be relevant to the users and faithfully represent what's going on in the company. And so 
they are setting the standards around sustainability and how sustainability is reported. So what you understand now about accounting and those uh, characteristics and the, the enhancing characteristics can be translated across as they start to think about sustainability standards. They need to be relevant to the users of the report and they also need to be able to be faithfully representing what's really going on in a company, not greenwashing and not a PR. It needs to explain what's really happening in a company. And I think if we can get that visibility then accountants can save the world. And this is Peter Backer that I talked about at the beginning. And he's, they've just released a, a report, a Vision 2050, which is all about trying to persuade companies to transform uh, how they work, to make sure that they're thinking about beyond the shareholders and uh, the, 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 what the world needs at the moment. And I thought this was a really useful quote from it. So data enhances companies' capacity to account for the true value of natural, social, and human capital used. So it's the value of the, those different capitals and it's about getting companies to really appreciate the value of those. So can accountants save the world? Yes, they're in a position, they've got the skills to do it. Will they save the world? I'm not sure, I'm not so sure about that at all. So today I've taught you about um, accountability and how the financial statements are the main ways that companies are held accountable. And if you remember a few years ago, the uh, of the top 100 revenue generators in the world, 71 are, uh, are companies. And the only way that they produce those true and fair documents that are checked and audited is these financial statements. And that's why it's really important for everyone to understand the basis of financial statements and the difference between profit and cash. And finally, there are ways that accounting can save the world. They can hold companies accountable for their social responsibility and their uh, climate change disclosures. The IFRS and the, the accounting world is changing and it is incorporating these disclosures. It's at a slow pace though. So will it make it in time? I don't know. Um, I wonder if any of this makes you think differently about the world of accounting and have a think about how the story, how are the stories told through the accounts that you read, um, what's important and how might that be translated across the sustainability reporting. Really starting to understand that difference between cash and profit might change the way that you read financial statements and think about, well, does it have a role? Yes. Will it step up? That's an even bigger question. So to finish today, I just want to ask you what you think about accounting now. It might be some of the same words or it might be something slightly different. And I'm going to have a look at those Q&As. Let's have a look. So if you can answer this question for me. So the same um, password, so responseware.eu. I'll put it in here. And the session ID is still the same. And let me get your responses for this. I'll to answer your question. So how can accounting be linked to the ESG dynamics of the company? It is already linked because it affects the cash and the profit, but also um, in these disclosures that a company is gonna have to make. How is the increase in private equity versus stock market investments impacting the way accounting works, if at all? I'm not sure it is truly being reflected enough. Um, I think a lot of the accounts are backwards looking. They don't even mention share price, whereas that's a really important thing for companies. So I don't think it's impacting enough. Do we cover ACCA and does a student get a grading in the ACCA system? Um, I don't think this is the course for that, but I'll let Ekaterina and Rupert answer that. Um, what else have we got? Would you accept that when evaluating business, you put 40% weight on the accounts and find other means to assess the other 60? Oh, Clement, that's a brilliant question. 40%, um, that's good. interesting to put a number on it. Probably, maybe a bit more than 40% because you've got to remember that these are audited and they can be relied on for that purpose. I think if you know what you're looking for in financial statements, and I've got a brilliant book around, um, if I can lay my hands on it, called the about how to read financial statements for investing purposes. So yeah, Clem, I'll be in that region. I think I'd be a little bit more than you would, a bit more than 40%. But they're, they're really interesting, but you need to know where to look. Mm. 
interesting model. Great to see something so refreshing. I feel we need a different accounting model as the way as a way the globe came out of a pandemic. This model could work on that level too. Absolutely. I think accounting is fantastic and I think financial statements are interesting, but they need to move a little bit more quickly than they are at the moment. Are accountants saving the world? I'm going to answer that with some of them are. <laughs> Brilliant questions. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed those. What have we got? More interesting than I thought. Oh, amazing. Um, colours of the painting, definitely. Transparency is vital and companies are often not very good at that. Useful for decisions, definitely. Necessity, definitely. Decision making, new things, results and processes. Provides insights on what happens in the world. Yeah, definitely. Save the world. The data can tell a story, but it does depend on who's telling that story. Oh, I need to see the end. Definitely more interesting than the... I wish I knew the end of that. It's not come up on my page. Difficult and mind-boggling. I hope that's given you an insight into um, accounting and the way that we teach you here at AMBS. It's not just about the numbers, although... That is important to understand the difference between cash and profit and the various um, statements. But it's also about how it fits into that wider world and the latest research, which can take accounting and can help it fit into this new world um, that we live in and can reflect the we can apply the what happens in accounts to what happens in sustainability and how that just can't come quickly enough. So thank you so much for all your interactions, your brilliant questions. And I'm going to hand you back to Ekaterina and Rupert to answer your questions about the MBA specifically. Hi there. Um, so Ekaterina, hopefully we'll be back on the session very shortly. Ah, she's there. Ah, here she is. <laughs> I am, but I can't see myself. So <laughs> We can see you, don't worry. Great. <laughs> yeah, we can see you, no problem. Yeah, I can see myself. Amazing, I'm back. Thank you so much for that, Jenny. That was a great, great session. Me and Rupert were just chatting in the background saying how much we we're enjoying it. So it was uh, new to us and very, very entertaining. <laughs> Excellent. It's a bit more, there's a bit more to accounting than people think. So when they arrive on the MBA, uh, they're either just very anxious about it or they because they don't know anything about it or they assume that they've they've seen it all before. But actually, we talk about things in a, in a different way and a refreshing way, I think, and linking it into the really big things that people care about. They don't realise that accountants currently have and in the future will have such an important role in that. Definitely. So, yes, yeah, so thank you so much for your time. So, um, um, hopefully, um, you know, we'll... Um, if candidates do have additional questions for you, of course, we can forward those on, but um, thank you for your time. And Rupert and I are now going to stay behind. Um, so if you do have any questions relating to the programs or the admission process, um, again, please do use the Q&A area and we'll be happy to help. Brilliant, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to hear from people. I'm, I'm easy to find on LinkedIn or um, there's my email address is jennifer.rose at manchester.ac.uk. I'm more than happy to catch up on this and I'll go and find out why uh, my why the screen stopped working for my little one half. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Oh, James. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. Thanks everyone. Okay, so I think we've got a question here. Okay, so I've got a question about years of professional experience. So somebody um, just wondering about the level of professional experience required um, for entry onto MBA programs. What we always say um, is um, to share a copy of your resume. So it's very difficult for us just based on a description of the number of years of experience to make a decision on your eligibility. So what we always recommend is for you to send a copy of your CV um, to one, um, you can either fill in the form online or just email it across to mba at manchester.ac.uk, specifying the program you're interested in. And what we can do, um, either me, Rupert, or one of our other colleagues, is just give you an understanding of what program will be best suited to you and your aspirations, but also what year of entry should be targeting. We can also talk about things like funding, discounts, scholarships. So that applies to anybody else in the room. Please do share a copy of your resume uh, with us. And what we can do is we can schedule an individual Zoom consultation or indeed meet you in person because we have now resumed our in-person um, events, both here in the UK, Manchester and London, but also globally. 
again, do use the Q&A area just to um, ask any additional questions. Okay, another question come through. Um, do you have a preference between GRE, uh, GMAT, uh, or GMAT for entrance to the MBA? We don't, we accept um, both those uh, admission tests. Now this would be referring to the full-time programme and I am conscious um, in the audience today, our candidates uh, considering all types of MBAs uh, in the terms of our offerings from professional part-time MBAs, where we don't ask for GMAT or GRE, um, but on a full-time programme, we do. Um, so, um, but if you are looking at the full-time programme and considering an application um, and weighing up the pros and cons between GRE or GMAT, um, it's probably good to hear that we don't have a preference on that. So whatever is best for you um, and your circumstances um, and that we can, uh, we can um, sort of uh, perfectly accept that. Um, that score once you once you've got it in place. We do recommend you you do get that test um, score in place before you apply, um, and that's a preference we we, we do ask for. Um, and again, we can advise on timings uh, and that kind of thing, depending if you're looking at applying for this year. Um, and we're still open and accepting applications for for September 2022, or it could be next year now for 2023. Um, and we can uh, certainly have a personal conversation with you around that. Great. There is another one here about offline classes. So I think you mean um, in-person classes. So yes, very much back on campus. Um, I was just speaking actually to one of our alumni based um, in Moscow because I'm traveling there this week and he was asking me, you know, how things were here in the UK. And for those of you who are not based in the UK, it may be difficult to understand because you may still have quite a lot of restrictions where you are. And um, things are very much uh, back to, um, I would say, pre-COVID levels. I don't know if you'd agree, Ruth, but it's very much no masks. Um, the yeah. campus is crazy busy. All of our students are back on campus for face-to-face -face teaching, and that includes MBA programs. And um, for some of our students on the distance learning courses that were not able to join us for um, their lectures in January, just because of the travel restrictions that were applied to their countries, we were able to offer some um, online learning. But for the full-time program, students were very much back on campus when teaching started last year. And the intention is that we do carry on with face-to-face -face teaching for our intake um, in September this year. So I hope that answers that. Uh, we have got a question through from the full-time MBA programme. When can I expect an update on the same? Um, we, we obviously have a rolling application pro process, but with um, a key deadline or application rounds, uh, typically every four to five weeks throughout the um, admission cycle. Um, and we like to have the process uh, wrapped up for a particular applicant within that same period as well. Um, so, so yes, um, total sort of admission period time would be about four to five weeks um, from the deadline date. Um, but again, you know, sort of do feel free to get in touch uh, around that. Great. So um, we've got somebody asking about experience events. So I did allude to those. So we are um, resuming our experience MBA events, both in Manchester, which is going to be on the 24th of February here on campus in Manchester. And then we're also going to be in London on the 10th of March. Uh, both events are on our website in the events section. So you can um, have a look at all the information and reserve your place or indeed get um, in touch with us um, after the event and we'll be happy to reserve a place for you. We are also attending um, events um, globally. So we are covering events um, in Europe, I'm trying to think where else South America wasn't it, Rupert. So, um, and, and Russia, as I mentioned. So again, if you're interested in meeting with us face-to-face, -face, you can find details of the cities we're visiting um, on the events section of our website. Um. Great. We've got another question here just about GPA on uh, on this, this time. Um, so going from GMAT onto GPA. Um, so that would be your bachelor um, degree score um, and whether is there a, a special minimum that we ask for. Um, not normally, actually. Um, and this refers to all of the MBAs we, we look uh, with we offer. Um, so a good degree um, from a reputable institution um, is, is more or less the sort of um, general prerequisite. Um, of course, what's more important when you're looking at MBAs is actually your work experience and your sort of career from the point you graduated uh, and those experiences that you can sort of share within the MBA classroom. Um, so, but we don't have a particular um, uh, level.
Oh, I think oh, you're back. Sorry, you disappeared there for a bit, but you're back. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Great, just picking up on some uh, more questions. Validity of the GMAT score. Is it five years, Rupert? Yes, five years. Yes, five years, great. And then um, I think we've got a couple of different questions about applying for the um, accelerated options of our part-time program. So there are no separate applications. So you just apply for the global MBA. And then what will happen is that the admissions team will look at your qualifications. So for example, if you do have finance qualifications, you will be offered the option of doing the 18 months finance accelerated program. If you've got significant senior management experience, you'll be um, offered the option to be considered for the um, for GEMBA, so which is the Global Executive MBA, but it is one application form. So you don't specify options that will be offered to you uh, when your application is considered. Great. Um, a question here, can a degree and professional qualification certificates suffice in the place of a transcript? Um, I think we do ask for transcripts to be in place uh, for, for applying. documents um, within with your application um, we do obviously need those to be translated or officially translated into English as well great and then a question about payment plans so yes there are payment plans um, um, that we do have in place for um, the part-time MBA that you're asking about so typically payments on our professional MBA programs and junior installments you typically pay in May and November every year there are also Another details of that on the website uh, another question about GMAT. Um, what is the average score requirement for the full-time MBA programme? Um, so the average uh, score within the current class, and this is actually consistent year on year, is about 650. Okay, so that's a good uh, score to have in your head when you're sort of going through the process of Oh, I think we may have lost Rupert. Any more questions? Questions coming through. Yes, we can hear you again. You're back. Okay, I've got a question here about previous qualifications. Does it matter if I have a master's? Not at all, you know, um, previous qualifications are great and they will, of course, work in your favour when your application is being considered. Uh, any more questions? Again, please do use the Q&A area. Okay, I think that that may be it. I think so. They've definitely yeah. slowed down now. Fantastic. Well, we will have uh, more um, events um, coming up online, which will be um, advertised on the events pages um, of our website. And there will be, I think the next one's a career focus Sunday, Rupert. That's correct. Yeah, that's happening towards the end of March. Great. So if you're interested in finding out more about the program, please do look out for the event dates. And again, we look forward to seeing you um, online again. I will be um, following up with you um, with a short email. So you've got my direct contact details. And as I said, uh, please do feel free to submit your CV either online or in response to my email. I'll be more than happy to set up an individual Zoom consultation with you just to talk a bit more about your profile, our programs, and hopefully match you to um, a perfect MBA. So thank you very much for your time um, and hopefully speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you, bye now.